Good afternoon. Uh, happy to take the uh, slot after the adjuvant guys. Those are always interesting and full of good information. Um, my name is Rob Hamlin. I'm Vice President of Procurement and Production for uh, FBN Global. Um, we've got a panel here today. Um, four of us amigos are going to kind of cover off a number of different areas of, uh, of, of the business and some of the supply chain. Um, we have to my immediate right, Jeff Thayer. Jeff looks after uh, Stern and Mixon and, and working with our partners that we produce both uh, internationally and, and domestically. Uh, Chad Kearns, one of our important partners um, from Sherm Industries. Chad makes a lot of products for us in, uh, in the United States and, and we enjoy a good partnership. Looking forward to hearing some advice and words from him. And then uh, Tom Lyons. Tom's in, in charge of uh, procurement and um, looking after some of the inbound uh, stuff coming from that way. So this is a little bit of the agenda of the items we plan to cover off. Um, we've got a little part to, uh, you know, kind of run through some slides first, just to set the stage and, and hopefully, you know, we get a little interaction and some folks have some questions or, you know, we spur some thoughts on that way. So. Um, If we look back over the past 12 months or e even 24 months, there's been a lot of activity and a lot of things that have changed for, for, for a number of different businesses. And, and really when we look at global crop production supply chain, there's a number of factors that ha have played into and a number of things that have changed. Um, you know, a number of surprises that, you know, things that you never thought about. You know, three years ago, we didn't really anticipate or any even have to think about small little trips inside from a factory where they produce a technical to get it to a port position where it could be shipped. That was, that was not, you know, there was something that would just happen either, uh, either at the factory's end, but with all the things that have happened, um, those little things become really big things. And those big things mean that you miss the vessel, mean that you miss your shipping window, mean that you miss your production slot at Chad's plant. I mean, there's a number of downstream effects um, from a lot of these little parts that have happened. So, you know, the climate kind of part of it, some of the flooding in China that happened last year, some of the freeze um, down in the southern US um, over the past while, I mean, there's been, port strikes, trade wars, all these kinds of things, you know, that really created this whole atmosphere in a lot of different industries of moving away from just in time, so trying to let capital and the efficiencies of using your capital drive your business decisions, to move into the spot where it's just in case. I better have some of this stuff in inventory just in case. And, I, and, and a number of folks in this room, you know, even down, you know, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, what business you're in, you've been looking at keeping more inventory around for to cover the gaps. So when we talk, you know, like shipping, of course, is, is a big part of it. And this drove a number of different, uh, different, different dynamics. When the shipping rates really took off, and you look at the peak of these charts, so shipping rates into the, you know, ex-China, basically, that drove a number of different decisions. All of a sudden, not only the price is sky high, but guess what? There's no availability. You can't get, you know, 40 foots. You can't get a number of different things. So there again, it changes all your dynamics. It changes all your cost, where some ingredients come from. All those types of things um, kind of turned around. But, you know, now we're seeing demand drop off dramatically. So now you're seeing the opposite effects, right, of particularly in, in, in the freight example. So you've got this seesaw going on, you know, in freight rates or, you know, cost of materials and all sorts of things. We haven't seen, you know, impacts directly in a lot of the, you know, domestic costs yet. But, you know, those types of seesaws make, make the supply chain less predictable and, and more difficult to manage. So, um, you know, we expect things like ocean, you know, the ocean carriers will reduce the capacity that they have, maybe park some vessels for a while and um, those types of things to basically meet more align with demand and, ho and, and basically raise their price and, or hold it at least, uh, but there's still lots of concerns. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting ride and, and, and 
you know, going forward right now, the uh, the uncertainty is is something that's really concerning and, and on our minds all the time. So, arriving at the new balance with all these factors now um, is something that will take some time. You know, we also see things like concentration of supply networks. So you have companies amalgamating or you know that continued concentration. Of, uh, of companies providing supply. Um, demand signals from customers, of course, are, you know, very important, you know, crop trends, what, what's happening, what are seeded acre trends doing, those types of things. Um, Pacific's role, you know, Asia Pacific's role in, in, in global trade is, is something that's, you know, politically um, something that's affected that way. So it, it, you know, it becomes something that's difficult to predict. Um, and, and, and really, I think if you sum up the new balance, really what, what we're all striving towards, and, you know, it, and it impacts at the farm as well, the visibility of that supply chain and the certainty of getting the things that you need you know, in, in order to grow the crop, so, um, or, or at least make it perform the best that, that it can. So, so really, that's kind of the balance that, that we're looking for and, and pushing forward. And we think because of, you know, in the last couple of years, we've had the advantage of looking at that entire supply chain. Going forward, we also see that, you know, we have an opportunity because of that end-to-end, -end, we can really supply um, a lot more certainty or, you know, at least bring stability around that. All right. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, growers in particular, thank you for the support of our business. My name is Jeff Thayers, Rob. Uh, alluded to. Um, I've been in the crop protection business since the early 80s and uh, I've seen a lot uh, over the last 40 years and uh, I personally would take three rounds uh, you know in, in the boxing match with Mike Tyson than what we've done over the last three years. Unbelievable how difficult it's been in supply chain and I know there's a lot of folks in the room here that are part of our organization as far as an extension of our, our, our team. We've, uh, and just to kind of highlight it just a little bit because it's unusual, uh, we've got like five Indian companies here that we do a lot of business with and active ingredients. We really appreciate their support. Uh, there's three Chinese companies here, uh, even though you know, lockdown and COVID, uh, you know, they've been able to, to come here and probably pay the piper on uh, going back and spending a week in the, in, in the hotel. We've got a number of raw material suppliers here in the U.S., Adjuvants Unlimited, Stepin, Ethox, and then packaging companies, uh, Cimarron Label out of Sioux Falls, and uh, Boxmaker uh, out of uh, Lawrence, Kansas. So though you see four of us up here, there's another, there's a whole army of people uh, behind us who we contact and talk to every single day. And in addition to that, and Chad on my right, he'll introduce himself, but CEO of Sherm, one of the largest tollers in the United States. We, we work with 10 different companies, managing uh, all of the inputs, all the key raw materials to them to, to get these products out the door. So I really appreciate, uh, we all appreciate the support uh, from those folks. <clears throat> um, so taking a handoff from Rob about uh, what we've just gone through and some of the calisthenics that we've had to do. So we traditionally would bring things in through Long Beach or LA, intermodal to Kansas City, Omaha, and then truck it to some Midwest tollers. And you guys all have seen, at least in the last 12 months, some of the backups at the LA port that last you know, t 10 weeks out there, you'd miss the entire season. So we had to do a lot of flexibility by going into Seattle, Oakland, a little bit of LA, Houston, uh, Nolens, uh, Charleston, Savannah, Newark, and Norfolk. So we went from like primary one or two ports to about 10 ports. So we had a tremendous flexibility and a, a group of our import specialists uh, worked you know, extremely hard to make that happen. But the, you know, the outcome of all of that is just tremendous flexibility when there's either work shortages, port delays, threat of a strike in, say, Savannah, we have the flexibility to move to, to other locations. Uh, we used to go port, intermodal, toller. Now we're like 
port truck to toller, but the rail is getting back in action, so we are starting to utilize uh, that again, and that'll help in some of our costing. The other way we did it on this graph, as you guys can see, kind of, it's tiny on the bottom, it's like 2019 through September of this year. Yeah, you know, we would order, it's about 30 days prior, so it'd take about 70 days to get here a couple of years ago. Then it's, you know, up to 82 days, but it'd be over 100 days. So we had to plan well in advance. And so, in particular, one of the products down in the southern rice market, Clomazone, it's a 12-month uh, order cycle. We have to order Clomazone in February of 23 for the 24 season. None of it's hit the ground in 23. It won't even go out until March, but that's kind of the predictability that we have to, uh, to get into, and we'll get into that in a second about you know, forecasting and supply. So one of the things I think is really important from uh, you know, our supply side, and, and you guys having confidence in our business, is um, uh, diversity of our suppliers. We've spent a lot of time not only in China and getting multiple suppliers of key active ingredients like glyphosate, glufosinate, paraquat. We've spent a significant amount of time the last couple, three years in India uh, building out those capabilities and also uh, having very, the same actives coming out of India to balance against uh, China should there be a, some semblance of disruption. So assurability of supply through diversification is, is really working in our favor. The other thing, as uh, just, just the growth side of things, we've gone from, in 2020, you guys have all seen the shipping containers that come in, we've gone from 400 containers, total business, in 2020 to close to 3,000 containers this past season. So whatever that is, a 500% increase in logistics and handling coordination, and, and it, it just couldn't be done without the support of our, our key partners overseas and helping in, in some of those activities. The other thing we've done is in U.S. manufacturing, I do want to point out that we do produce about 85% of our products are produced in the United States using you know, U.S. labor, whether it be raw materials, packaging, certainly logistics, and then toll operations. The other 15% tends to be somewhat unique in nature in terms of products and small campaigns. It makes sense just to bring in a turnkey product and make it happen. We also uh, produce up in Canada, uh, for folks uh, from, uh, in Canada in here, uh, glyphosate up in Saskatchewan. So we're, we're you know, sourcing raw materials up there, packaging and supporting uh, you know, toll manufacturing. The other uh, thing that's really important, you guys may recall the uh, Texas freeze, uh, February two years ago. It basically knocked out 80% of the formulation capacity for AgCam uh, that year. We just got lucky because we were small. We had most of our stuff already produced or hedged those raw materials into the uh, toll manufacturing, but some of it we didn't do. And there's a couple of companies I alluded to in here, Adjuvants Unlimited in particular, just absolutely went to the max for us and uh, helped us uh, meet the need for you guys. The last thing uh, is this uh, you know, data-driven insight. We try to get as good as we can on forecasting with global supply chains. You know, we tend to, I, I mentioned 12 months on Clomazone as an example, but some of the raw materials to make Clomazone are 18 months lead times for the factories in China. So we're talking three years down the road of people positioning to make some of the products that we're, we're trying to get out to you guys. So we are, we're using uh, through uh, you know, Tom's efforts and, and Emily's efforts on um, SNOP, uh, better planning, better forecasting, machine learning, so we can kind of tighten that up. We do want to have inventory to meet demand, uh, but we also, you know, don't want to carry significant inventories. To, you know, as part of it. nobody in business wants to do that. So we're getting better. Uh, again, I'm going to wrap this up really just to say I really appreciate the well appreciate the support of the growers and you know FBN Canada, Australia, United States. It's been a phenomenal run. The, the, the business growth is, is unbelievable compared to some of the other companies that I've worked at. So again, it's all driven. The efforts that we put in and our suppliers put in it all uh, for what you guys do in support of our business. I really appreciate it. Thanks.
one slide. Hello? There we go. All right, so hello everyone. I'm Chad Kern again. I'm the CEO of SHRM USA, uh, based out of Texas. Uh, we've been in business since 1976, and we are one of the leading toll manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, what kind of makes us unique from other toll manufacturers is we're what we call uh, neutral manufacturers, so we do not have any product registrations of our own that come out of the plant. It's strictly uh, customer driven. So uh, it, it gives us a different level in the, in the market. And also at our plant, we, we touch on just about every formulation in the ag industry uh, and livestock, uh, home and garden line. Uh, so we, we could pretty much do it all at our facility. Uh, so uh, it's a large facility, but it's still not enough. And over the last, I've been with the company 15 years, we've grown every year. And the mission is, you know, demand. What, what do you need as farmers to make sure product gets to the field on time and, and the quality that you need? So that's been our mission. Uh, and, and working with the FBN team, uh, they were nice enough to invite me here. They're great to work with. Uh, our mission is to have enough capacity on a tolling platform to manage the farmer's needs in the, in the field. And through the last two years, uh, kind of started three years ago, but definitely over COVID, you know, there was a lot of things, as you can see, have stacked up. Uh, we're kind of the bottom line, uh, the beginning to the end, I guess you could say. So these guys and, and gals work forever to get products to us on time so that we can formulate those products and get them to you on time. And without that teamwork, none of it happens. Uh, it's a lot of scheduling goes on a year, you know, right now it's some, some two years in advance to our assets, uh, they'll be booked up. And uh, you can have all the assets in the world, but everyone wants their product in a certain window, right? So everybody wants their products between November and March. Well. That takes double the assets if you want them in a six-month period instead of a 12-month period. So how do we manage that? Uh, some of that we can do through carryover. The other part is we need more assets. So something that our company is committed to this past year, uh, we have purchased a new location in the, in the Midwest. It's uh, Southern Illinois, which is where I'm from. I grew up there. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting a plant in uh, Benton, Illinois. So it's a 40 acre site, all herbicide liquids for now. And that should come online here in January. Uh, so it's a big opportunity for us to get closer to the market and provide more assets on site to take care of your needs. Uh, we're also in Ennis expanding at the same time in Texas. Uh, and what makes this unique is this team that's sitting with me uh, you know, they've made a commitment uh, together that we're putting in dedicated assets. So FBN has said, look, we're not going to fight over line time. We, you know, if something's two weeks late, we don't want to get pushed out of a slot. We want our own dedicated units to where we can provide our farmers with the products they need when they need it. And thank you all, but as a group, we're making that happen. So those assets will come online here in the next month. And, and really make a difference to the supply chain that you're looking for as farmers. Uh, the other piece of this puzzle is labor. Since COVID, we have taken a huge hit in U.S. manufacturing for labor. Uh, when COVID hit, we had 215 people in Texas. By the end of COVID, we were down to 176. And it's taken us over a year to get back to normal numbers. And it's taken some price increases. I mean, you see it all around the country. McDonald's is moving prices to $15 an hour. You know, it's just things we'd never dreamed would, would happen in a short period of time. Well, uh, we're trying to mitigate that. And, but we've come into a market where we've done what we had to do to get the labor. So we now are fully staffed and ready to hit the 23 season full steam ahead 
with uh, about a million and a half more gallons of asset that we had in 22. So that's great news for farmers, great news for us, great news for FBN. So thank you all. Well, let me share the mic, I guess. All right, so a little bit of what I wanted to share is, is the FBN approach, right? So talking about kind of, you know, where we've been, you've heard, you know, some of the challenges over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, as, as a newer company, um, hang on a second. All right, I got it. We, we've got the opportunity to kind of build this uh, from the beginning, right? So thinking about what, what, what sort of a supply chain do we need as a company that can really leverage the capabilities that, that are needed to support the growth of FBN and, and to support the growers uh, in FBN. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so um, these are a few of the things that we look at as sort of the fundamentals, must-haves in, in the FBN supply chain. So, you know, first and foremost, safety and compliance. Um, and I'll talk about these in a minute, but safety and compliance is our first and most important aspect of, of our supply chain design. Quality, product quality, the ability to do process improvements, um, partnering uh, strategically with key partners, and then efficiency overall. Right. So, you know, these are these are the things that really we look at and we say this is these are the elements that are very important to us as we put together our supply chain. So, what do I mean by safety and compliance? Uh, so, you know, first and foremost, these are very complicated. Products. They're, they're regulated by government agencies. There's a, a tremendous amount of care that's put into making sure through the FBN regulatory team that we have the proper processes in place, proper registrations in place uh, to be able to do business in the um, uh, countries and, and states that we're in. Uh, so we, we put a significant amount of effort into the alignment of our formulation designs and our registration parameters. FBN has uh, an internal registration team that, that guides us in that. Um, developing the manufacturing process. So, you know, this is something where, you know, engineers in, in FBN are working with, you know, folks like Chad, uh, when we're launching a new product, before we can sort of just take it from a, a lab bench and, and, and run it right out to the warehouse, we, we first do scale-up work uh, to take that recipe from our formulation team and do testing on it, make sure that we uh, have the right manufacturing process established, that we're putting together the right systems um, in, in the, the toll, toll areas to make sure that we hit the right quality for the product. Uh, Chad mentioned this a little bit, but uh, you know, looking at kind of strategically, you know, shifting our manufacturing around. Uh, so where we can, uh, we look at uh, opportunities to manufacture in the countries where we sell the products, so in U.S., uh, Canada, and Australia. Um, it gives us the opportunity to have some control over the processes. We can, uh, you know, manage the timing of the, of the material flows and everything uh, just a little bit more efficiently. Um, Jeff mentioned, we, you know, the vast majority of the volume that we sell in the U.S. is produced in the U.S., um, although we do have also quite a few products that we uh, manufacture internationally as well. So quality, uh, very, very critical step of the process. Uh, it's not worth it at all to get a product at a good price and then uh, you go to use it on the farm and it's uh, absolutely worthless to you, right? So we have uh, a global quality team, uh, FBN employees, uh, you know, working in all of the regions that, that we sell in. and. Uh, working on all aspects of, the, of that product quality. So not only the formulation specifications and the regulatory that I mentioned before, but you know, things down to the packaging. You know, are we, are we sourcing uh, you know, the right type of bottles? Uh, are, do the seal, foil seals leak? Uh, what kind of cartons are we using? You know, all of these elements. Uh, we've got a, a tremendous amount of support from a lot of our suppliers that are helping us build these, these types of systems. The pictures that you see here are just some examples of even, you know, when we're um, importing products from overseas, um, working with our suppliers to give them guidance on how we want the totes put into the containers, how they should be arranged, we want them wrapped in cardboard, we want them strapped in a certain way, you know, all these kinds of things uh, to make sure that when the product does arrive, it's in good condition. Uh, 
we, we audit our manufacturing partners, uh, so Chad will know <laughs> we come around. Uh, but, uh, but that's all done in the spirit of continuous improvement as well, right? So, you know, we, we want to go to the sites where our, our products are being produced to make sure that, uh, you know, we're aligned as far as everything uh, that we expect for the product. Um, and then I mentioned packaging standards as well. Ongoing work there to look at um, all aspects of uh, how we do the packaging of our products. Our partners are very, very critical to our success. Jeff mentioned we have several um, of our strategic partners here today. And I, and I think that's, that's an example of the FBN approach. You know, we, we really wanted some of our key partners to be here today, you know, uh, at uh, Farmer to Farmer to meet customers and just learn, you know, just directly as possible, you know, what is FBN all about and what are we working to achieve? And the more we can educate our suppliers about, uh, about the FBN mission, uh, the better we're going to be as an overall team. Uh, we run a global procurement organization. We, we source raw materials from uh, all over the world, Asia, uh, US, uh, Australia, um, you know, all major areas. We, we work to mitigate our risk. So, you know, we're always looking for where we have a single source supply. It's not always possible to eliminate that completely, but where we can, we'll make sure that we have more than one supplier of a key material, uh, as well as uh, geographically to make sure all of our supply isn't coming from one country. If we, if we can, we'll balance the supply across different countries, right? So some of the freight things that Rob mentioned, um, when you get into some of those challenges, you can divert our purchases around the globe. Um, and uh, overall, I think, you know, the FBN approach is really about partnerships. Uh, you know, we're working very closely with all of our key suppliers, our manufacturing partners, um, because we're in it for the long haul, you know, we want to grow a business that has a really solid base of, of key partners that, that enjoy the FBN model and the, and the success that has come through with FBN uh, to date. So. Uh, and then finally, efficiency. You know, so kind of once we get through all those things, then, you know, then it is time to look at cost, right? Uh, and, and we look at the, the total cost. Uh, so it might not just be, well, let's get the cheapest raw material. It, 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 you know, we're looking at the manufacturing costs, the logistics costs, the warehousing, all of those things that add up to create that supply chain cost. Right? Uh, so um, I think from an FBN perspective, we've got a lot of uh, opportunities to, to put that puzzle together in different ways to get the most optimal cost um, at any given time. So I think that's it. We'll probably wrap up here and maybe switch over to some questions. But uh, I guess just to uh, just to close and say thank you, uh, thank you everybody for uh, making this a really exciting week. Uh, it's really encouraging to see um, everybody come out and, and participate in Farmer to Farmer and uh, give us the opportunity to talk more about FBN and in particular the FBN supply chain and what we can do to continue to support everybody. So thank you. The hard questions go to Jeff. How are you doing? Um, as far as production goes, what's been in the in these supply issues? What's been kind of your Achilles' heel as far as the most difficult product to get a hold of or to find? You know, to move manufacturing somewhere else because of supply and chain uh, disruptions. What's what's been your nightmare? Um, it's, it's a combination of things, but, you know, if you're asking about, you know, difficult line time, you know, at U.S. manufacturers, it would be dry flowable products, DFs, so Metribuzin DF, uh, Chlorancelam, uh, our product, sulfane chlorine, very difficult to get line time, uh, and also a little bit challenging to make, um, but I would say this, uh, we're in pretty good shape uh, going into 23. I mean, we're probably in the best shape in the history of FBN on product supply. 
I mean, the last two years were just unbelievably crazy. And then prior to that, uh, FBN really was not a manufacturing company. It was really a sourcing company that would buy aftermarket material and then push it through our, our channels. So we feel pretty strong about the supply of our products uh, this year. Now, Tom and I were on a podcast yesterday and asked, somebody asked the questions about uh, well, how do you know if you have enough product? Well, we try to read the tea leaves as best we can. You know, back in 2019, our forecasting model was have a hunch, buy a bunch. And that was kind of it. <laughs> Wing it. But, you know, with uh, really bringing in some discipline and uh, machine learning, SNOP, better communications with sales organization, looking at import records. I mean, we've tried to, we almost overanalyze this thing. But generally speaking, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of volume. And, uh, you know, if we want to brag on ourselves for a second, which I like to do, is, uh, I mean, if you look at some key products in the United States, like Clethodem, FBN's gone from, you know, two containers a year to number two in the U.S. in total clethodim sales. We're the second largest paraquat company in the United States behind Syngenta. We're number two in Azoxy products behind Syngenta. Uh, we're number two in Sulfentra's, I mean, you can hear the, the theme here, T number two behind FMC and Sulfentra zone and related products. Number two in Mesotrione. I mean, we've gone from nothing to you know, almost market leader. And so all of that manufacturing, all of the folks I mentioned earlier supporting the supply chain, it doesn't just kind of happen. It, it's a real arduous process, calls, things like that, help companies like, uh, like Chad, C, uh, CJB down in Valdosta, Microchem in Georgia. A lot of companies are involved in, in our success, but what we really want to do is plan for the next three to five years. We're making you know, tens of millions of dollars of investment in capital for that growth. We haven't really crossed the line in terms of buying our own plants and making uh, our own products. We're noodling that um, a couple, three years out perhaps. But I don't know if I've really answered your question, what's the most difficult, but I guess if difficulty means just finding line time, it's all the way back to this, the dry flowables for right now. My question goes along with what he kind of said. Um, there's been rumors that some of the products, ingredients, and in like Sure Start and Staunch too are, are getting hard to hold or hold of from like Germany. Um, looking forward, is there a product that you see in the future that, uh, in the foreseeable future, that's going to be something that you want to get hold of sooner rather than later, as a, as a farmer perspective? Sure. So you know some of the unique mixtures and those type products that, that you see short in the market once in a while. And, and, and also I would say probably, you know, from a value perspective too, there, you know, there's quite a few of those products maybe that are, are uh, priced quite high, but you know, it's Rob, we should have you on the stage to talk about product development, but you know, in the pipeline for sure is, is, um, is those type mixed products. Um, a little more difficult to formulate. You have to have, you know, there's a lot more diligence going on in, in you know, in the background with uh, with our folks on the regular team, like uh, Amy Carter and, and David Faulkner and some of those folks working on those projects. But um, so the future, for sure, we're I would say we're not too far away from all, you know, those types of things, um, and 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 especially around something like you know, like Sure Start or Stalwart 3W or you know, some of those type mixed products. Um, shortage of ingredients, I mean, if you, if you think about some of the products that may, you know, still be difficult to get a hold of because it's not, you know, really predictable, um, you know, you, you've seen quite a bit of shift away from Europe. If you look at import records from a few years ago, you'll see a lot of uh, glufosinate coming in from Germany, you'll see a lot more uh, metallochlor and those kind of products coming in from Europe as well. Um, you know, even uh, diquat or, or paraquat, you know, there's been a shift away from that, right? And so some of those have moved to China. That caused some of the problems last year, right? Kind of bottled up demand. Now we're seeing production come on, so it's kind of evening out. But, you know, there's still a lot of those things that, you know, where there's a European, you know, dependency, um, that production now is a little bit, I, I, I would say, 
in you know in question and and mostly from a cost perspective for them right because of the war and all that but yeah i think maybe just to add to that a little bit the uh no doubt the the energy situation in in europe has has impacted a lot of production there and we've seen you know some of the products that are traditionally made in europe have have moved to China, uh, you know, to to uh, to get capacity. So it's interesting times to see the you know plants that are maybe traditionally um, providing supply of you know different branded products. They're they're having to source uh, from a lot of the same suppliers that you see in uh, India or China just to uh, keep up with that supply. So and those are those are the kinds of things that we have to track all the time uh, to make sure that uh, you know we're getting our forecasted needs met and that the su supply chains are running smoothly uh, hi my name is Austin from Southern Illinois and uh, and uh, I was just curious uh, it seems like the uh, import uh, is the holdup I guess and the reason for maybe the increase lately is there some reason why um, we can't just make it all here, uh, resource-wise. Is is there some reason why these raw materials are they just not available in the U.S. to start with? Are you going to talk about like the invention of sulfentrazone and <laughs> painting towns white or anything? <laughs> Kathy's here. Remember. I think you're asking about the active ingredients and. Uh, I guess I'm the only guy left standing from really that worked in a synthesis plant uh, back in the 80s, made the first bifenthrin, first clomazone, sulfentrazone. But what happened, quite honestly, is um, you know China uh, was able to. I mean, U.S. business uh, looked towards China. The manufacturing costs were substantially less. In the, United, in the United States, and, and one, at one time, 70s and 80s, U.S. was the leading active ingredient producer in the world, and we exported all over the world. Soviet Union, China, India, you name it, we shipped it there. Um, yeah, no disrespect to our Chinese partners in the room, they've done their due diligence, their parents and grandparents back in the day, but quite honestly, we got our asses kicked by China uh, through more or less government subsidies. We destroyed our own synthesis capabilities in this country through a greed by corporate America. That's the situation. Whether we can change that or not is to be determined. I think we need to change it. I think we need to balance it a little bit. We are doing some balancing acts with India, uh, some others, um, Latin, uh, South America, token out of Europe, uh, but very limited. The investments, I mean, it's serious investments. We had this like $1.7 billion, trillion dollar deal with the Biden administration. We need about $100 billion for our industry to make these products be more self-sufficient. It's a national security issue, in my opinion, on our food supply, and we got to bite the bullet. And if we don't do it in another 10 years, it could be even more challenging. So that's kind of a situation. I'm not running for any office up here, <laughs> but I've made my point known to our representatives in Washington that we got to get real. And uh, that's, that's my opinion. I'm pretty passionate about it, but uh, is that, any other questions? I mean, it's, listen, it's not just the United States. If we can unite with Mexico, United States and Canada, that's a pretty powerful uh, part of the world. And uh, we probably can cover 80% of whatever we need in agriculture if we pull that off. So it's not just all in the backs of, of the US. There are a lot of different uh, formulations of uh, generic Roundup. Are, are there, what's the differences in all the generics, like on the Roundup? We'll get the formulation guy. Yeah, you're not going to get paid for this, though. <laughs> Hello, my name's uh, Rob McClinton. I lead our product development organization within FBN. The difference between, doesn't matter if it's a generic Roundup or a generic other product, there's 
Overall, the regulatory scrutiny of the active ingredient that goes into a generic pesticide versus a branded pesticide is the same, and it has to be deemed equivalent to do that to pass the regulatory scrutiny of, you know, whether it be the EPA in the US, the PMRA in Canada, and the active ingredient drives by far the bulk of the performance. That being said, when a product is formulated, you're adding lots of different things, adjuvants, um, things to make the product actually work better. And the differences that you can find in some generics is the quality of the coformulants or the adjuvant packages that they put within it. Um, at FBN, we do a lot of work when we're designing our own products to test to make sure that the performance and lots of characteristics, not only the efficacy in terms of how to work with the plant, the usability in your sprayer, your handling, the mixability with other things, and the coformulant package makes up a big part of that. So what you might see for really, really low cost generics is they might reduce the quality of those things in there, or they might not do the testing to make sure that uh, you know, they are as compatible or as user friendly or as close to the branded products out there. That would be the difference in the really low cost. We, we put the work in, we're not required to do field trials in the US, we do field trials comparing our products to other, um, to the branded products and other generics in the market to ensure that the performance is the same. And so that's one thing that you have to, to look out, out for. But like I said, if you're buying an FBN brand, a Willowwood brand, a Farmer's First brand, as we, we come out with that, you can be confident that we're gonna be doing the testing to make sure that the performance is as good as the branded products that you're gonna get out there. So the one thing I can add from my side as the person that, that are making those products, uh, we have 35 different customers across the world, tier one down to you name it. And you know we have a chemist, a full lab at our facility. So that chemist sees every formulation in the industry and we as a manufacturer, even though we're bound by NDAs and, and these folks like making chocolate chip cookies, right? They give us the recipe, they tell us the steps, and then here's what we want you to test for at the end. That's the bare minimum, okay? So at our facility, you're looking for the bare minimum. This is what the customer requires. But when you have a chem chemist that's been in the industry over 20 years and has touched every formulation in history, he is not going to let something go out the door that he knows looks bad or, you know, th there's times where something will come through and it passes an assay, but you look at it and it's like, that just doesn't look right. Did we make a mistake or, or what did we do? And he gets, you know, the relationships that we have with an FBN, these folks are great. I mean, it's very open. There's a, there's a table about five rows back there with, with the whole line of folks from FBN. That's our, that's our team right there. So my folks and those folks talk weekly, sometimes daily about quality. Does it look right? Is it on time? And so from our standpoint as a manufacturer, I mean, again, don't hold me to that. I'm not in a political position, but it, it's, it's like buying generic Tylenol versus you know the name brand Tylenol. Does it still kill your headache? Yes, it does. It's just a matter of who made it and the quality. And when it's made here in the US, the quality's there, I can assure you that. Uh, Brian from Michigan. Uh, part of your job and to a degree, some of our job is to plan for market disruption for, for these black swans we've heard about today. Uh, tell us your thoughts on a scenario of a uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan in the next five years. Well, that goes back to the national security uh, thing I just mentioned. Um, obviously, we hope that that doesn't happen. Um, don't know what the outcome would be of that situation. But uh, part of our diversification uh, to India uh, to uh, almost replicate the active ingredients that we source out of China, not everything, but a lot. Um, it would probably be a stretch to cover the demand of the United States, Canada, and Mexico if that were to happen, if there really was and truly a trade embargo with China. Um, it, would, it would be uh, very disruptive. I suspect, um, you know, everybody in this room is pretty uh, ingenious on figuring things out. 
Uh, there'd be some new technologies coming. It could be this sprayer thing next door uh, that cuts the use requirements of pesticides by 40, 50 percent. They probably wouldn't be able to buy one if, if something like that were to happen. That's how hot those things would be. So these new technologies that are coming in could be an old, you know, kind of a backup option. I mean, if it really started getting intense, um, so in 1991, during uh, Desert Storm 1, I was running FMC supply chain in Philly, and we, we put contingency plans in place. We ordered a year's worth of materials and, and built up inventory in anticipation of that turning into World War III. So that type of uh, planning uh, needs to go and start to resonate uh, within our industry and, and many other industries, if that's going to happen, if Xi Jinping decides he owns Taiwan. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not something um, that we all want to really uh, visualize or have happen, but we didn't want Ukraine to be invaded either. That is not as perhaps detrimental with Russia being the size of New York's economy. It's almost insignificant. But China's much larger, much more important to, to the world. Hopefully that doesn't happen and whatever happens over there is peaceful either way. Independent country or some kind of a Hong Kong hybrid, don't know. But there'll be technologies that will come in and, 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 and supplement uh, some of the supply out of China for sure. Yeah, and some of it does come down to, you know, choose, that's one of the things that we think about a lot is around choosing the right partners. So, you know, if we're lined up wherever these, you know, if the partners are in China or, you know, India sometimes as a backup or whatever, um, you know, having those, the right, working with the right folks that can provide some flexibility and, you know, be, deck, you know, ability to adjust in situations because, well, that's one situation maybe we can think of. There's probably 20 more that we have not thought of yet and could something could change in some other area, right, and affect us. So it's, you know, it's kind of the strength of working together in the partnership to find a solution way through. That's it? We're, we're, we're getting the hook. Well, one more question? Time for one more. I got one minute. Hello, Nathan from uh, Sioux Center, Iowa. I sometimes keep chemical, extra chemicals or uh, kind of shoot for low inventories or high inventories of my chemicals that I leave over one year or the other. And I'm wondering if you see a chemical going down in price significantly or up in price significantly, let's say for, for the next crop year, if there's something that we should, should stock up on or, or make sure our inventory is down to zero. Who's got the best crystal ball? It's, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, real quick. Um, so the last couple of years have really wreaked havoc in supply and also pricing. This is, prior to that, the previous 15 years have been fairly, you know, even keeled, modest increases, some declines, you name it. Uh, my, our crystal ball would say there's probably, uh, you know, reduction in pricing, so inventory that you may have on hand is probably a higher priced inventory. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna work through that as best you can. Um, but the resupply of the next wave coming in, generally across all products, is uh, trending downward. Um, now for an FBN positioning, I mean, we, we have our production schedules locked. We know exactly the kind of volumes we're gonna produce. We wanna, hopefully sell out. My, I was talking to a guy at breakfast. My, I told him what I would do if I was in his shoes is if he wants to support FBN and uh, the programs that we have and, and you know, the terms and conditions, buy perhaps 60% of your requirements and then in season take a look at what you might need. Um, we will sell out of some of our products. So um, this is the way it is. But if you want, if you want our products, I would buy soon and then in season depending on the product the other 40 percent you may have to go to somebody else to get it i don't know if that answers your question but it's about the best crystal ball i can put together here 
my last thing was, you know, we've been practicing for like a month up here. You know, Chad's the lead singer. You can see we're the background singers. We, it's the holiday season. We, we sounded really good, but before we came up, we flipped the coin whether we were going to sing or talk supply chain. So you got the supply chain out of the coin, so we're sorry about that. LAUGHTER